Shabbat Shalom. I'm Rabbi Stephen Sager, and I am your virtual scholar in virtual residence on this wonderful Shabbat that is a complicated Shabbat. It is a beautifully complicated Shabbat. It is, first of all, Shabbat, which makes it extraordinary under every weekly circumstance. It is also Shabbat Shekalim, which is to say it is the Shabbat that telegraphs ahead the beginning of the collection of half shekels for the temple that will help to supply and supplement what's needed for Pesach so that all the pilgrims can come. It is also Shabbat Rosh Chodesh Adar, a month in which we are supposed to be supremely happy because Queen Esther saved the Jewish people from the machinations of the wicked Haman during the month of Adar. And happiness above happiness above happiness, it is also a time to honor Ed and Stacy Hamburg, longtime fellow travelers of Road Fate Sedek and longtime fellow travelers and friends of mine and of my family. They, like Shabbat Shekalim, help to focus people's attention on what's important to community and supplementing community needs. They make the month of Adar and every month taste and feel a little bit better and a little bit sweeter. And they make Shabbat in and of itself a little bit more delicious than it would be under other circumstances. This is a Shabbat in which we read Parashat Mishpatim that comes after the giving of the Torah from Mount Sinai. And it contains rules and regulations, ordinances, those things that kick into place that su supplement the Ten Commandments as they are gloriously and dramatically given. Conjure up your favorite movie in which the Ten Commandments are given and you hear the sonorous booming voice that says, I am the Lord your God, a theme to which we will soon return. We're also going to return to another theme from last week's parasha, which is the theme of the cloud. Moses disappeared into the cloud last week, and his disappearance into the cloud is echoed in this week's parasha. The Chumash right beside me will prove it if you're not ready to take my, my word for it. I will read to you from the, from the chapter that ends the parasha. He said to Moses, come to the eternal, you and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders and Israel. And Moses alone shall step near the eternal, but they, those others, shall not come close. And then a little bit later on, in that same chapter, almost in the words of last week's chapter, Vayavu Moshe bitoch he'anan, Moses went into the midst of the cloud, and there he disappeared. You and I and the others who stood then and now at Mount Sinai could not see him. We wondered. We traveled in our, imagination, in our imaginations along with Moses, but we saw him disappear and wondered what happened. And were it not for the storyteller, who was embedded perhaps with a CNN film crew, we never would know what happened when Moses disappeared into the cloud on his ascent. Say the sages, Moses started from the ground and ascended the mountain, but the place to which he arrived was really heaven itself. And there Moses found himself confronted by a raging, storming throng of angels who were complaining bitterly, don't give it to him. Don't give it to him. That Torah that's been up here for hundreds and thousands of years, you're going to entrust to a human being? What is humankind that you would pay them any mind, said the angels, quoting a psalm that had not yet been written and yet apparently was available to them in heaven. 
You're going to give it to them. They're going to get their fingerprints all over it. They're going to start breaking those rules. They're going to take this beautiful, pristine Torah that has been up here for eons, and they are going to drive it off the showroom floor and drive it to their local supermarket, and they're going to ding it up immediately. It's immediately going to be contaminated and spoiled and its rules broken. Moses was taken aback. Perhaps if we dare say it, God was taken aback. And God said to Moses, you know, you're going to have to win it from them. You have to argue with them. And Moses said, what are you talking about? You told me when to be here. You told me that I should come on this day. And you told me I should come at this time. And here I am on the right day and the right time. And you said I was going to get the Torah. Well, but I didn't count on this, said God. You must win it from them. And they look angry, said Moses. They do look angry, and I'm afraid of them. The truth is, they look so angry that they could burn me to a cinder in a second, said God. Hold on to my throne. And then you'll be safe to argue with them and insulated against their heat. And Moses turned, and sure enough, the divine throne was sitting right there. And Moses held on to the throne and turned to the angels and said to the angels, this Torah that you are so interested in preserving, what's written in it? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Moses said to the angels, I don't remember seeing you in Egypt. I was there and I don't remember, remember any of you. Is this Torah therefore relevant to you? I brought you out of the land of Egypt. What else is written in it? You shall have no other gods before me, said Moses. I suppose that's a problem for you angels. Is it not true that being in the divine presence, in the presence of the presence, in the presence of the throne, that that's not compelling enough? You still think there might be other gods who have earned their right for your allegiance? This doesn't seem to be for you. What else is written in it? Honor your father and your mother. And Moses said, do you have fathers and mothers such as would make this commandment relevant in your lives? We have fathers and mothers. And let me tell you, honoring them is not always easy. And we would love to be supported by a commandment that urged us to so honor our parents. And what else is written in it? You shall observe the Sabbath day, said Moses. Come on, that can't be a problem for you. The rumor on earth is that the elevators stop on every floor, every Shabbat. It can't possibly be a problem for you to be keeping and remembering the Sabbath. What else is written in it? You shall not kill. Angels kill? Do angels have such impulses that would even make them want to kill? Can angels and the community of immortals, can anyone die? Does it have any meaning? What else is written in it? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You mean like swearing that there's really five pounds of potatoes here instead of three? Do you really swearing by God's name to something that you're trying to sell or something that you're trying to buy? Do you have such professions as would make that relevant? Is there anything else that you can think of that's in it? You shall not covet. Oh, that must be a big problem for angels, said Moses. You see, Moses said to the angels who were shame fat faced and aghast and impressed by Moses' articulation. You see, the Torah wasn't meant for you. You have been its guardians, pristine and pure and wonderful, docents, keepers of the Torah in its museum case. But that's not the reason that it was created and that's not where it's destined to be. It is destined to be with me 
and my people. At which point the angels became admirers of Moses and were told that each one gave a gift to Moses. I want to ask you the following question. I've overstepped my time limits just a little bit, but I'm going to overstep them a little bit more. Who do you think was uttering those words? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Was it the angels? Was it Moses quoting? You shall have no other gods before me. How could Moses have possibly known to quote it? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Was Moses asking the angels and the angels reciting so that Moses could then comment and serve back or hit back his argument against the angels? I think none of those are real possibilities. I imagine the following, and with this I will leave you, that it was God, the divine self. And it was God, the divine self, who was responding to the inquiry of the attorney, Moses, arguing his case. And that those of us below, while we did not see or did not know the scene, we were listening to God reciting Aserata Dibrot, the Ten Commandments. That that was the revelation of the Ten Commandments. Not any disembodied eloquence that came out of no context, except that God had in the divine mind from Alpha to Omega in one thoughtless moment, decided to, to bring all of these life-giving, life-saving, life-preserving community building rules together and had articulated them or was reading them from a document. No, this was living, breathing Torah, I'm suggesting to you. Stand below Mount Sinai and hear it for yourself. The only reason God says these things and says them with the passion with which the divine presence says them is because Moses has forced it, has elicited it, has made it come out, heavenly Torah, as it were, that was brought about because of that which happened on the earth below.